that we continue to worship and fellowship with you, Lord God, and with saints that come in our past, Father. And we know that they are few and far between, Lord God, but we thank you for those that we do come in contact, Father, who are of like mind, Father. And it is a blessing, Lord God, when, when we do, and may we be a blessing to others as we go from day to day, Father. Even those that may not be uh, deserving, Lord God, I pray that you would lead and guide us and uh, speak through us and may we be a witness and a testimony of your grace and your goodness, Lord God, wherever you have us be. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord God, that those um, other churches, Lord God, that are gathered in your name today, Lord God, will lift your name on high, Lord God, that they will glorify you, Lord God, and that they will not be discouraged, Lord God, as they look around and see the um, devastation in Christianity, Lord God, may it cause them and us, Lord God, to be even more diligent and stand even firmer upon your truth, Lord God. Be with Harley as he brings forth your word, Lord God, and I pray that you will continue to teach him and speak through him, Lord God, and may many be blessed by your word that comes through your servants, Father, all over the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we are continuing in our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Revelation. And we are going to wrap up this 18th chapter today. And we'll be moving into the 19th chapter. Uh, the rest of the narrative of the book of Revelation moves rapidly, moves fast. Events start to happen real quickly. We're going to take our time with it, of course, like we always do. Make sure we get it as right as we can as we pray that our understanding of the text is. But this uh, 18th chapter, of course, is the complete devastation of economic Babylon, which begin at chapter 17, the devastation of the religious system. And chapter 18, the devastation of the... Uh, economic system and when you put it all together it's really one uh, devastation it just breaks it up into chapters for our understanding again the influence of the great whore is worldwide and uh, everyone was a part of that system and God is well he's putting it into the systems of man and the system of the devil and uh, we who are believers should look forward to that day with great rejoicing because certainly heaven is going to be rejoicing as uh, we will see. We're looking at, actually we left off at verse 20, but I do want to go back a little bit more continuity. Verse 15, the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off uh, for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls for in one hour so great riches has come to nothing and every shipmaster and all the company in ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of a burning saying what city is like unto this great city so everyone associated with the great whore with Babylon that made their livelihood from her, whether it was a shipmaster or whether it were sailors or those who were transporting the goods of merchants, everyone and anyone that had any connection with Babylon uh, and anyone and everyone that had connections with her that made great profit uh, from her uh, were broke for good because now this thing, this devastation affected the entire world. Verse 19, and they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing. And that's all a sign of great mourning. Uh, when someone you love is dead, there's that sign of great mourning. And certainly they love Babylon. They love the great whore. And now she's dead. The system is over. And all they can do is weep and wail and throw dust and ashes upon their heads. All the riches of, the, of that city, all the riches everyone made with their associations with Babylon were gone says, Alas, alas, a great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For one hour is she made desolate. So all the mourning 
going on with all the kings and the merchants and everywhere, we look at a different response, quite the opposite response from those who are in a, a different location from earth. And those are the ones up in heaven. Verse 20, rejoice over her, thou heaven, ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. So where you have earth crying and grieving and moaning and weeping for her destruction, heaven is the exact opposite. They are rejoicing over her destruction. So whatever the response was on earth, the exact opposite was seen in heaven. And we've already seen time and time again, we're going to see it even again today, that all throughout this book of Revelation, God promised to avenge his own for the horrible treatment that was done to his church. And we looked at Revelation 6, 9 through 10, and Revelation 11, verses 16 through 18. So, the point again, no matter what the heathen do or attempt to do, or no matter how they try to secure their worldwide joy, um, the, the, the end is going to come, and the destruction of God's wrath is going to come, and there's not going to be any more joy. And we're going to see even the specifics, the sound of this and this and this, and marrying and giving in marriage, all the joys associated with life, all the joys associated with marriage, and things going to be done, going to be done. And a mighty, verse 21, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Now, I understand that the predominant view of many of the commentators, of course, is that this was symbolic or a symbolic act from the mighty angel which signified the swiftness of the destruction of Babylon, the swiftness and also the completion. I mean, it was a huge millstone thrown into the, into the waters. And if you could see something like that, I'm sure it would be a, a huge splash, a huge destruction. And having said that, of course, um, there seems to be a, a similar symbolic act in Jeremiah chapter 51. I do want us to turn there. Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 60 through 64. Now, many, I'm sure, have inquired as to why I have not gone to a lot of Old Testament references uh, to, I guess, either interpret or bolster the book of Revelation. And the answer simply is, I said many times, the, the book will interpret itself. It's not necessary to try to find things all the time. I mean, the book is quite clear. I think it's systematic. Where we would need to go, we go. But, uh, you know, I've, at this particular time, today is supposed to be the end of the world. You know, so just that you know that uh, I got paid the other day, so I guess I ought to run up all my, I don't have any credit cards. I guess I'll just go spend every dime seeing today's end of the world. You know, I don't want to leave here with income, miles will be broke. How stupid is that? But today is supposed to be the end of the world nonsense. Everyone um, runs around trying to find some idiot to believe and to follow um, to, to satisfy this rapture fever. You know, a fever the Bible knows nothing about. You know, the Lord wants us to keep living life every day and just doing His will. Uh, not to look for signs and things like that. And one brother was telling me that he wasn't he wasn't actually trying to look for signs at the same time telling me that there are signs. I'm not, I'm, he says, I'm not date setting, and at the same time, he's setting a date. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite absurd, you know, these things that, that go on in the name of the Lord. And it really, uh, above being embarrassing to yourself, making yourself to be an, an outright fool publicly, more importantly, far important than that, it, it, it once again gives the enemies of God an opportunity to blaspheme because we do something so ridiculous. But the, the point I'm trying to make is you don't have to go running around looking for everything to happen. You know, God's perfect timing and perfect plan and, and when he's going to come and get his church, it, it's, it's already done. What we need to do is just interpret the scripture, keep living life, keep giving up the gospel, keep living for his glory. Because no man's going to know the day or the time or the hour. 
uh, that's reserved for the father and, and your formulas and what have you is going to make a, a bit of difference and so today we're supposed to be in the world what it should be is today um, you should be renouncing anyone and everyone who has uh, believed this foolishness and has um, given out this foolishness as a false teacher that they are and, and none of the Old Testament um, you had to be 100% accurate or else you'd be stoned to death even if you did miracles that didn't matter because the word was more important than the miracles and the same thing should apply today of, of, of course minus the stoning but people should be regarding these these knuckleheads as false and they should be exposed and they should be uh, rejected we shouldn't have to keep looking for things and following fools just follow the scripture the Lord knows he's going to take care of it <coughs> excuse me uh, Jeremiah chapter 51 verses 60 through 64 and some imply that this is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy concerning Babylon and I can't argue against that fact in, in a lot of places in the Old Testament is this future destruction of Babylon foretold by many prophets so let's read these four verses of Jeremiah because it, it looks quite clear so Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon even all these words that are written against Babylon and Jeremiah said to Sariah now Sariah was for all intents and purposes just a, a, a scribe he basically was a servant and his role was to write the words down and Jeremiah said to Sariah when thou comest to Babylon and shalt see and shall read all these words then shall the Lord, uh, then shall thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place, to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate for ever, and it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it, and cast it into the midst of Euphrates, and uh, thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. So go back to Revelation. Sounds quite clear, um, almost verbatim, that this is what's going to happen. And Revelation chapters 17 and 18 prove that what Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah chapter 51 um, came to pass, exactly as he has stated that Babylon was going to sink and Babylon was going to be no more. And notice the, 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 the imagery here that Sariah took the book after he read it, wrapped it in the stone and threw it, almost similar to the angel casting a millstone into the sea. I, I find it quite interesting. So you don't have to run around trying to make stuff up. The book interprets itself and where the Old Testament supports and gives us clarity in the prophecies, that's what we should do. Not only does this symbolism signify the swiftness of the speed of the destruction, but the devastation associated with it. So, a look at the word violence, and a mighty angel, verse 21 of Revelation 19, took up a stone, like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence, shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more. Uh, the word violence is a very interesting word. It, it really, there's the Greek word attack. and but, but not some long campaign. We talk about military campaigns. You know, you set up your plans and your soldiers and you want to fight this battle and take cities and you have what's called a long campaign. Well, you don't want that. This attack um, is quick and instant. In fact, the word also, where it talks about being thrown down, in verse 21, uh, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more. Uh, the words being thrown down in the Greek means to throw or let go of a thing without caring where it falls. <laughs> so, God's going to destroy it, and he's not going to care about having anyone to see where it is he doesn't want to be seen he wants it to be gone and it's going to be gone so it's going to be gone to the place where there'll be no remembrance of her because no remnant will be found concerning her nothing will be left 
you know, when you look at this, you, you absolutely see that there is no grace and no love from a human standpoint here at all. Not that that matters, of course. What you do see is the great divine retribution of the holy and righteous God. That's what's here. I'm not going to get into a, a love issue today because it's not about love. It's about retribution. It's about, well, frankly, it's about God loving those saints up in heaven who have been martyred for him. Interesting. It is the great divine retribution of the holy and righteous God. Heaven's going to rejoice, perhaps as never before, seeing the end game of God's plan come to pass. That's going to be great rejoicing. It's going to be great rejoicing in particular to those who have suffered and who have been martyred for Christ. It's going to be great rejoicing. Now, look at, let's go back to earth, go back to Babylon and see how tremendous this devastation was. And the effects of it are worldwide. Since Babylon's outreach is global, the effects of Babylon's destruction are also global. So look at verse 22 of Revelation uh, chapter 19. And the voice of the harpers and musicians and of the pipers and trumpeters. Chapter 18, chapter 18. Is that 18? I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So it's good to have people read their Bibles. Um, 18. And the voice of the harpers and mus I'm just eager to get to 19. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. So all the worldly entertainment that was associated with Babylon, and remember, whatever happens there, the outreach is global. All the endeavors, the worldly endeavors, all of their amusement to the full, all going to be gone. All of the singers, all going to be gone. Arts of every kind, particularly music, and there's such a huge reduction ridiculous overemphasis today on music. I mean, music, to me, has really eclipsed thinking. Music, to me, has eclipsed thought. There is much more, too much more passion given over to music than it is thinking. Growing up, thank God I grew up in the 50s. I tell you, I, I get to see all the madness, the, the transforming of a society. Back in the 50s and the early 60s, the focus was on reading, study, logic, critical thinking, thought, etc. Now it's all on subjectivism and emotionalism and thinking is seen to be that which actually is outdated, outmoded, and, and despised. So we, it's stupid time for a society. Everything's built around stupid. Stupidsville, USA. And all the music is built around more stupidity. So logic has been eclipsed by all this music. And that's now. You know, and to me it's only going to get worse. I don't see our society getting any better. You know, we God is doing things in this country to try to no, excuse me, to get our attention. He's not trying. God doesn't try. God is doing things in our country devastatingly to get our attention. And clearly, we're not paying attention. In fact, what we're doing is we're amping up more stupidity to drown out the noise of God. In other words, it's all the part of the suppression that Paul talks about in Romans 1. So we're, we're just making music louder, you know, focusing more on stupidity. News is nothing but propaganda. So we're, we're just constantly going more and more faster, bolder, louder into stupidity. And thought and reason and logic are gone. And that's even true in the so-called church. But in this day, it's going to be so prominent. It's going to be the norm. It's going to be norm. And, and the beauty is, all that's going to be gone. All that's going to be gone. Sculpture, painting, statuary. We're all carried to the greatest height. This In this time period during the book of Revelation, right before the destruction of Babylon, Humanity and humanism will reach its highest goals. All of what people are trying to do now, all the Democratic Party, all the rhinos, all the 
the fakes and phonies and frauds and their push for humanism and their push towards you know, humanity reaching its highest goals. You can do anything you want to do and, and God is being pushed down or ignored or whatever or suppressed. In this day, during the book of Revelation, it's going to reach its highest peak right before its destruction. Not even the sound of a millstone shall be heard any more in thee. There be no production of any kind. None. Not only the arts that adorn life, but even those employments without which it cannot subsist will cease from thee forever. All of these expressions denote absolute and final eternal destruction. That's what's coming. But people living on, you know, today, they're lollygagging around and living and doing life as if it doesn't matter. And the constant rejection of God and his truth, the constant rejection even of the faith, the apostate church, all these fakes and phonies and coming out aisles and coming to stadiums and coming to arenas, but they're not coming to the Lord. You know, all this just adds to the apostate religion that just engulfs the world, but particularly in the United States. Incredible. All that's going to be gone. Verse 23, And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Very interesting. So not a single candlelight, not even a candlelight will be seen in Babylon any longer. Not one flame. There's not going to be any search party. <laughs> no one's going to survive. Incredible. Not, not only in the totality of Babylon will be this, be this destruction, but not in any single part. In every, rather, every and any single part, there shall be not a single candlelight seen. The devastation will be complete and total. Marriage and all of the joy with it, the groom and the bride, all their friends, all gone. Days over. Why? For thy merchants were the grandees once. The grandees. Uh, the grandees is a word which defines someone highly influential and respected, especially a politician or a nobleman. So, where the merchants were the grandees, okay, once, but now these merchants uh, these merchant princes and all the rulers and all the people associated with them are gone in an instant. Period. They were all taken in and deceived by her sorceries. Very interesting here. Uh, the word sorceries is a Greek word pharmakia that's spoken of in Galatians chapter 5, I believe. Um, pharmakia at that time and in the future, will always deal with drugs, medication, and the magical arts together. Okay, drugs and magic. We're not talking about, you know, sleight of hand magic here. We're talking about real wickedness, demonic, magical arts. Okay, so I, I want you to know that. One writer said, quoting, if one is puzzled over the connection between medicine and sorcery, as illustrated by this word, our word pharmakia, he has only to recall quackery today in medicine, patent medicines and cure-alls, witch doctors, professional faith healers, medicine men in Africa, and the quote. So in other words, you shouldn't be really surprised at the connection between uh, drugs and sorcery, because it's everywhere. In that day, it's going to be the norm. You look at how, or I look at how, I don't know how anyone else is looking. I look at from my birth in the 50s, how drugs were virtually unavailable. You had to have really some kind of a, of a case to be able to get medicated. I mean, the doctors in the day just wouldn't prescribe these things to people. And you look at from, let's say, the, the, the late 50s until today, everybody's drug. It is the norm, the standard now to medicate people. Now they're even promoting this stuff on TV in, in droves. And everyone's smiling and happy, even though the side effects, most of them are death or death-like, related to death. Oh, you know what? 
I'm I'm not getting any sleep. So they got the cute pictures of the fake, the fake sleep word and the fake. This is how stupid we are. You know, she's trying to get some sleep, and you got the little gray dog. Supposedly, this dog-like creature. His name is Awake, and then you got the white creature named Sleep. And, and see, see, you say she's the the they, they're cute. There you go. That's what the that's what the drug companies want you to conclude. They're so cute. <laughs> Maybe if you take this drug, you'll start seeing them. <laughs> and you know, it's supposed to be a sleep aid. I'm saying, here we go. And the list of side effects: suicide, delusional. You know, um, what do they call that? Where, where you you can awake, your eyes are, open, or you think they are, but you can't breathe, you can't move. What is that? That called medically? It's in my head. I don't know why I can't say it. But it's 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 like a shock. You, you, you. Your eyes open up and you're trying to move, but you can't. Paralysis? Well, sleep paralysis, that's what it is. Sleep paralysis, stuff like that. And all these, all of these side effects are a part of this happy, happy, fake dog, you know, word looking cute creatures. You know, they want you to be stupid. They, and they keep putting these things out. And you got Chantix, I, I'm, I quit smoking because of this. And, and, you know, the side effects are, are a thousand times worse than nicotine. Not that I'm endorsing nicotine. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I just don't do anything like that. But you, you have all the, all the, the, the commercials. You've never seen a commercial in the 50s and the, well, not the 50s, but the 60s in particular, advertising drugs. I've never seen them. And once they got started... And once people, you know, conservatives started saying we shouldn't be doing this, and then after a while they just put another and another and another. Now, you know, shows are sponsored by these companies. It's incredible. And now you see all these commercials for everything, everything. That's now. And there's still a few of us left that go, you know what? This is ridiculous. In that day, in this day coming, it'll be normal. We're already seeing the normality of drugging our kids with everything in the world. Now, don't spank the little runt. Just give him another drug. Dope him up where he'll cool him, cool him down. Someone needs a spanking. Now, you can't do that. I'm going to call, you know, CPS. That's all right. I'm going to call SWITCH, too. But you can't do that. So let's keep drugging our kids and drugging our society. So you, you already made a drug-dependent generation. And then with the legalization of marijuana, you're going to have legalization of everything. It's just around the corner. And, and that's nothing compared to what's coming. To what's coming. Even all the things I read in this quotation, it doesn't matter. What's coming is going to be far worse. People are going to be given over to sorcery and medication. It's going to be the norm. Behind every single one of these demonic acts, and that's what it is, is none other than Satan himself. And during this time of tremendous visible deception, no doubt the nations and their people will be deceived. But that day is coming to a close. It's going to end. It's going to end with the Lord. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and all of that, all of and of all, rather, that were slain upon the earth. We've seen this in Revelation 6, 9, 13, 8, 16, 6, 17, 6, and to come, 19, 2. So, she's guilty, and she's paid for it. God's swift wrath. That concludes chapter 18. See, we get by. We can get through it. Now we're going to look at chapter 19 because that's about heaven all about rejoicing and after these things i heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying alleluia salvation and glory and honor and power unto the lord our god for true and righteous are his judgments for he had judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and had avenged the blood of his servants at her hand you see this over and over and over again. And I'm wondering today, where are the people who are talking about the righteous God, the righteous God who's going to, well, he's going to 
perform retribution for the saints. I don't hear anyone talking about that. I hear this sloppy, syrupy, fake God who's always about love and never about judgment. He's always about, listen, listen, he's always about love but never about righteousness. I'm sorry, that's not the God of Scripture. We create our own God. We act like God's going to, you know, I hear the song or heard the song, you know, that we could change the, with the love of Jesus, we could change the world. We can't change anything. How are we going to change the world? We, we are not even changed. The, the, all the church knows how to do is sway and sing songs and be apostate and hate truth. In the name of Christ, we shall change. We can't even change ourselves in his name. We don't even know what we're doing. You got one group over here so arrogant, they think they got this whole Holy Ghost thing wired. And with that kind of pride, I don't know what to do with it because you think you're the cat's meow. And if you don't come my way, well, maybe you're not one of the body. Really? Forget you. You're, you're not the source of the Spirit of God, to be sure. And he certainly isn't abiding on you. And I don't need to come to you to have the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the second person of the Godhead, and you're not the first. Okay? So let's, let's, third person of the Godhead, rather. So let's, let's get that straight. The Spirit of God is the third person of the Godhead, and you're not the first or the second. So I don't need to come to you to get the Holy Spirit. And by the way, it's incredible that as much as you tout the Holy Spirit, you seem to forget that He's holy. Because you don't seem to be living as a person who was filled with the Spirit of God. But I don't like this idea today of, of one attribute being just completely overshadowing the fact that God is righteous by nature. He is ultimately righteous, and that righteousness demands retribution for sin. And you look at the character of God, that he is to be feared. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We don't persuade men by that at all. People don't fear God. We don't project the message of fear of God because I don't think most of us fear him. It's all about love. No, it's all about righteousness, and we keep forgetting that. That God's righteousness demands retribution against sin, a retribution for sin. It's going to happen. So after all the events of the destruction of Babylon, the scene goes back to heaven and the great rejoicing that will take place. And this is where the Hallelujah Choir will sing with great joy. All of heaven rejoices because of the great attributes of the Lord God. That's interesting. They all rejoice and they constantly do, and they always have, because of his great attributes. Salvation, glory, honor, and power be unto the Lord our God. It's amazing. I love that. I love that. And these attributes are seen throughout the book of Revelation. So, let's just go back. Chapter 4, verse 9. I mean, we see this. It's all in the Old Testament, praising of God. But this, this heavenly view, we get to see only in Revelation like this. And there is great praise, great rejoicing of the attributes of God. Verse 9 of Revelation 4, When those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, and the four and twenty elders fall down before him, that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created so in the fourth chapter we have already seen that one of the reasons given for the hosts of heaven giving glory and honor and power and worship and praise to God is the fact that all of creation which he created is created for his pleasure and his pleasure is why they were created. So they're praising him, they're giving him the same praise because he's a creator. And that's critical. We've seen that in chapter 4. Go to chapter 5, verse 11. 
And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. In other words, there's a lot of them there. A lot of folks up in there, and I, I can't count them. I'm just, I'm just saying infinity, as far as I'm concerned. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing amazing and so when we were in this chapter um, we talked about the seven elements of praise that the host of heaven gave to the Lord I'm not going to go through all seven I just want to point out the ones that refer to the text that we are looking at in chapter 19 uh, the word where it says in verse 12 of Revelation 5 where these are lamb of slain to receive power the word power uh, the word strength, the word power uh, in this word here uh, is the same word power in chapter 19, verse 1. And it means strength or the ability or the might. And it speaks of one who has complete ability or might by nature. And God has complete power, complete strength to accomplish his purposes that's it whether it's whether you talk about creation whether you talk about final devastation whether you talk about what people say now providence whatever God's power he has complete ability and might to accomplish his purposes and no one else can prevent that they can't they can't do anything to distract those purposes and that is, it is fitting that he, he should be regarded as having such ability and to be praised for this ability. There is only one, one who alone is worthy of all the glory and the praise. Only one who alone possesses inherent ability by his own glorious and eternal nature. And by reason of his own inherent strength and might, do whatever he desires in the heavens and on earth. Period. This is the kind of God we should be telling people about to believe. Rather than following the idolatry of the speaker saying repeat after me. As if you had some inherent power to convert anyone's life. And you don't. And if you believe these things that I teach you, you will be a Christian. That's a damnable lie. I would never say that to her. And I have in the past. And boy, I repent of that. And tried to contact some of those people too and tell them I was wrong. I don't have any power to tell you if you believe certain. You believe what God says in his word. That's all I can tell you. I can't tell you to repeat after me. And if you really believe what I just told you to, to say, <laughs> then you're a believer. That's not, that's, not, that's not anywhere near a Bible. It certainly isn't in a Bible. Nowhere. Only God has that kind of power. No one else does. And it's not you choosing him, it's him choosing you anyway. And that's for a whole different topic. But if you think that you have inherent power to either come to the Lord, even though the Bible says there is none righteous, you have no righteousness, you, and you're not seeking, well, I sought the Lord. No, you didn't. The Bible says there's none that seeketh God at all. And you're not seek, you're not the exception. You don't come to God because... You listen to like eight or nine bands, eat some hot dogs, and have smoke and stuff rising up out of a stage around your head and be clouding your brain. And then someone appeals for you to come down and you come down and you, 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 you. Where's the Lord in all this? You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and produce fruit. He does the choosing. All through the New Testament we see it. All through the Old Testament we see that. We're telling people that they're of God and they're nowhere near the Lord because they haven't come by his ways. We're trying to circumvent what God has done. It's more just Darbyism. That's all it is. And we're just proud of our ignorance of history and otherwise. It's by God's inherent ability by his own glorious and eternal nature. By reason of his own inherent strength and might to do whatever he desires in the heavens and on earth. We should be teaching that God to people. 
not the God of the evangelist and the 40-minute the message and the six hours of music. Utter nonsense. Yeah, and I said it. And if you are not praising God for that, for who he is, according to the Bible, you're in the bond of wickedness and the dullness of spirit. We should be teaching people about the God of Scripture. I am tired of the idolatry that is disguised as God when it is not him at all. What you know about God is in this Bible. All of the Bible, I might add. Stop with your bits and pieces, eminent picking Bible. Then it says glory. The word glory, same word used in 19 verse 1. The word glory is translated splendor and brightness. And even if you look at the beginning of Revelation, you see Jesus and all of his wonderful glory. I'm tired of seeing all these fake pictures. It seems like they're just going bonkers. And now they got this movie coming out about Jesus as a kid. Wonder where they got that script from. Oh, I could tell you from their own evil hearts. So Jesus as a child. Now people are stupid enough to even follow that nonsense. Anything except the truth. What, what you need to know about Christ is seen in Revelation. Because that's who he is right now. He's not, okay, get your, get your Jesus movie, get your Jesus movie jive, get it out your system right now, because you're all going to see it, because you got to have that, got to have that visualization, this, 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 this is a visual people, open your eyes and put it in the book, see that, Stim stimulate your text, it's a visual age, open your eyes and look in the book, morons, falling for the world's lie, it's incredible, Stupid stuff. We just believe anything. I, I was amazed even how fast idiots said, you need to get rid of your grass. You know, green brown is a new green. Stupid people. They let their grass die. Yeah, you didn't know about that? Yeah, brown is a new green. In other words, dead grass is the new green grass. And people believed it. And they made many commercials and programs and found the idiots who promote a, yeah, you know, I love my grass. You had no grass. You, your grass been brown. In fact, your grass is dirt. Dirt is the new green for you. It's nothing but a sand pile there. But, you know, they got these people to believe you, rationing, and you need to, we, need, we need to ration. Just goose step behind every idiot that tells you to do something. But you want to tell me that you're intelligent. Yet you can't find time to study what God says and believe Him. You can't find time to see in the Bible the exact representation of his glory and his splendor and his brightness and his aura and his majesty, which tells you right in this book that you so busy listen to the devil and fools tell you not to read because it's too mysterious and too this and too that. Every book is mysterious and hard when you don't read it. Every book is closed. Well, the Revelation is a closed book. Well, if you open it up, you can read it. Incredible how we just believe every gullibility. And we think we're smart. No, we're not. So you got strength or power and then glory. And then, uh, let me look at this word again. Let's see here. Still in 15. I'm sorry, 5. See, power, riches, wisdom, strength. The word strength means power. Okay. Lord Almighty deserves glory and honor and power meaning the power that manifests who you are as the Almighty God, he deserves praise for that too because of his magnificent and miraculous power. God is to be praised for all this. And heaven is doing it. Thankfully, someone is doing it. Because we're so busy looking at ourselves and thinking this is all about me. Everything about about salvation, everything about God, everything about everything is about me. Totally self-centered bunch of humanists. It's not about you. It's all about Christ. And all those who praise God in heaven are clearly telling everyone who reads, it's all about Christ. He deserves the honor, the praise, the glory, the majesty, etc. We're down here waiting to get to heaven because we think heaven is about us. Really? totally self-centered we think it's about us no it's still about him and it's all about him and it's going to be all about him forever 
and not about you and thinking you got I, what I'm going to do when I get to heaven. If you get there, you're going to worship God just like everybody else is worshiping God. You're not going to be submitting your plans to the Almighty and telling him what you want to do. I even hear people say, I'm going to sit on Jesus' lap. You need to be quiet. That, that to me is sacrilege. You're going to sit on his lap? I tell you, friends, I don't know what these people are reading. They need to put their medication down or take it or something. This stuff is absurd. Yeah, and I said it. It is absurd. And don't ask me to change because I'm not. You need to change. You need to repent. Tonight we're going to continue uh, looking at chapter 19 and also the references related to the wonderful glory and majesty of our God. This is the God that we need to be preaching and teaching people. This is the God that people need to know. Not the nonsense that we project out of our own idolatry and foolishness. Lord, thank you again for who you are revealed in your wonderful truth, the Bible. And may we, Lord, continue to focus in upon who you are and then and only then can we properly give you the praise and the honor and the glory. We don't want to praise you in ignorance. We don't want to praise you because others are doing it. We want to praise you out of knowledge. Knowledge of who you are and who you are is revealed in the truth, in the scriptures. Bless and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord willing, get to see you back here tonight. Uh, same time. Actually, four, same time, four o'clock. California time this evening. We'll continue in chapter 19. So until then, may God richly bless you and keep you is my prayer.